Chapter 7, Overcoming Obstacles. The primary difference between a rich person and a poor person is how they manage fear. Once people have studied and become financially literate, they may still have roadblocks to becoming financially independent. There are five main reasons why financially literate people may still not develop abundant asset columns that could produce a large cash flow. The five reasons are number one, fear, number two, cynicism, number three, laziness, number four, bad habits, and number five, arrogance. Overcoming fear. I have never met anyone who really likes losing money. And in all my years, I have never met a rich person who has never lost money. But I have met a lot of poor people who have never lost a dime, investing that is. The fear of losing money is real. Everyone has it, even the rich. But it's not having fear that is the problem. It's how you handle fear. It's how you handle losing. It's how you handle failure that makes the difference in one's life. The primary difference between a rich person and a poor person is how they manage that fear. It's okay to be fearful. It's okay to be a coward when it comes to money. You can still be rich. We're all heroes at something and cowards at something else. My wife's friend is an emergency room nurse. When she sees blood, she flies into action. When I mention investing, she runs away. When I see blood, I don't run. I pass out. My rich dad understood phobias about money. Some people are terrified of snakes. Some people are terrified about losing money. Both are phobias, he would say. So his solution to the, the, the phobia of losing money was this little rhyme. If you hate risk and worry, start early. If you start young, it's easier to be rich. I won't go into it here, but there is staggering difference between a person who starts investing at the age of 20 versus 30. The purchase of Manhattan Island is said to be one of the greatest bargains of all time. New York was purchased for $24 in trinkets and beads. Yet if that $24 had been invested at 8% annually, that $24 would have been worth more than $28 trillion by 1995. Manhattan could be repurchased with money left over to buy much of Los Angeles. But what if you don't have much time left or would like to retire early? How do you handle the fear of losing money? My poor dad did nothing. He simply avoided the issue, refusing to discuss the subject. My rich dad, on the other hand, recommended that I think like a Texan. I like Texas and Texans, he, would, he used to say. In Texas, everything is bigger. When Texas, Texans win, they win big. And when they lose, it's spectacular. They like losing, I asked. That's not what I'm saying. Nobody likes losing. Show me a happy loser and I'll show you a loser, said Rich Dad. It's a Texan's attitude toward risk, reward, and failure I'm talking about. It's how they handle life. They live it big. Not like most of the people around here, living like roaches when it comes to money, terrified that someone will shine a light on them, and whimpering when grocery clerk shortchanges them a quarter. Rich Dad went on. What I like best is the Texas attitude. They're proud when they win and they brag when they lose. Texans have a saying, if you're going to go broke, go big. You don't want to admit you went broke over a duplex. He constantly told Mike and me that the greatest reason for lack of financial success was because most people play it too safe. People are afraid of losing that they, that they lose, were his words. Fran Tarkington, a one-time great NFL quarterback, says it's still another way. Winning means being unafraid to lose. In my own life, I've noticed that winning usually follows losing. Before I finally learned to ride a bike, I first fell down many times. I've never met a golfer who has never lost a golf ball. I've never met people who have fallen in love who have never been had their heart broken. And I've never met someone rich who has never lost money. So for most people, the reason they don't win financially is because the pain of losing money is far greater than the joy of being rich. Another saying in Texas is, everyone wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to die. Most people dream of being rich, but are terrified of losing money, so they never get to heaven. Rich Dad used to tell Mike and me stories about his trips to Texas. If you really want to learn the attitude of how to handle risk, losing, and failure, go to San Antonio and visit the Alamo. The Alamo is a great story of brave people who choose to fight, knowing there was no hope of success. 
They chose to die instead of surrendering. It's an inspiring story worthy of study. Nonetheless, it's still a tragic military defeat. They got their butts kicked. So how do Texans handle failure? They still shout, remember the Alamo. Mike and I heard this story a lot. He always told us this story when he was about to go into a big deal, and he was nervous. After he had done all his due diligence, and it was time to put put up or shut up, he told us this story. Every time he was afraid of making a mistake or losing money, he told us this story. It gave him strength, for it reminded him that he could always turn a financial loss into a financial win. Rich Dad knew that failure would only make him stronger and smarter. It's not what we wanted to lose. He just knew who he was and how he would take a loss. He would take a loss and make it a win. That's what made him a winner and others losers. It gave him the courage to cross the line when others backed out. That's why I like Texans so much, he would say. They took a great failure and turned it into inspiration, as well as tourist destination and makes them millions. But probably his words that mean the most to me today are these. Texans don't bury their failures. They get inspired by them. They take their failures and turn them into rallying cries. Failure inspires Texans to become winners. But that formula is not just the formula for Texans. It's the formula for all winners. I've said that falling off my bike is part of learning to ride. I remember falling off only made me more determined to learn to ride, not less. I also said that I have never met a golfer who has never lost a golf ball. For top professional golfers, losing a ball or a tournament provides the inspiration to be better, to practice harder, to study more. That's what makes them better. For winners, losing inspires them. For losers, losing defeats them. I like to quote John D. Rockefeller who said, I always try to turn every disaster into an opportunity. And being Japanese American, I can say this. Many people say that the Pearl Harbor was an American mistake. I say it was a Japanese mistake. From the movie Tora Tora Tora, a somber Japanese admiral says to his cheering subordinates, I am afraid we have awakened a sleeping giant. Remember Pearl Harbor became a rallying cry. It turned one of America's greatest losses into the reason to win. This great defeat gave Americans strength and America soon emerged as a world power. Failure inspires winners and failure defeats losers. It is the biggest secret of winners. It's, it's the secret that losers do not know. The greatest secret of winners is that failure inspires winning. Thus, they're not afraid of losing. Repeating Fran Tarkenton's quote, winning means lose, being afraid, unafraid to lose. People like Fran Tarkington are not afraid of losing because they know who they are. They hate losing, so they know that losing will only inspire them to become better. There is a big difference between hating losing and being afraid to lose. Most people are afraid of losing money that they lose. They go broke over a duplex. Financially, they play life too safe and too small. They buy big houses and big cars, but not big investments. The main reason that over 90% of American public struggles financially is because they play not to lose. They don't play to win. They go to their financial planners and accountants or stockbrokers and buy a balanced portfolio. Most have lots of cash and CDs, low yield bonds, mutual funds that can be traded within mutual fund family and a few individual stocks. It is a safe and sensible portfolio, but it is not a winning portfolio. It is a portfolio of someone playing not to lose. Don't get me wrong, it's probably a better portfolio than more than 70% of the population has, and that's frightening. It's a great portfolio for someone who loves safety, but playing it safe and balanced on your investment portfolio is not the way successful investors play the game. If you have little money and you want to be rich, you must first be focused, not balanced. You must look at a successful person, at any successful person, at the start, they were not balanced. Balanced people go nowhere. They stay in one spot. To make progress, you must first go unbalanced. Just look at how you make progress walking. Thomas Edison was not balanced. He was focused. Bill Gates was not balanced. He was focused. Donald Trump is focused. George Soros is focused. George Patton did not take his tanks wide. He focused them and blew through the weak spot on the German line. The French went wide with the marginal line. And you know what happened to them. If you have any desire to be rich, you must focus. Do not, 
do, do not do what poor middle class people do. Put their eggs in many baskets. Put a lot of your eggs in a few back baskets and focus. Follow one course until successful. If you hate losing, play it safe. If losing makes you weak, play it safe. Go with balanced investments. If you're over 25 years old and are terrified of taking risk, don't change. Play it safe, but start early. Start accumulating your nest egg early because it will take time. But if you have dreams of freedom, of getting out of the rat race, the first question to ask yourself is, how do I respond to failure? If failure inspires you to win, maybe you should go for it, but only maybe. If failure makes you weak or causes you to throw temper tantrums like, like a spoiled brat who calls an attorney to file a lawsuit every time something doesn't go their way, then play it safe. Keep your daytime job or buy bonds or mutual funds. But remember, there is risk in those financial instruments too, even though they may appear safe. I say all this mentioning Texas and Fran Tarkington because stacking the asset column is easy. It's really a low aptitude game. It doesn't take much education. Fifth grade math will do, but building your asset column is a game in which attitude plays a major role. It takes guts, patience, and a great attitude toward failure. Losers avoid failing, and failure turns losers into winners. Just remember the Alamo. Overcoming cynicism. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. Most of us know the story of Chicken Little who ran around warning the barnyard of impending doom. We all know people who are that way. There's a little Chicken Little inside of all of us. As I stated earlier, the cynic is really a little Chicken Little. A little chicken. We all get a little chicken when fear and doubt cloud our thoughts. All of us have doubts. I'm not smart. I'm not good enough. And so and so is better than me. Our doubts often paralyze us. We play the what if game. What if the economy crashes right after I invest? What if I lose control and I can't pay the money back? What if things don't go as I plan? Or we have friends or loved ones who will remind us of our shortcomings. They often say, excuse me, what makes you think that you can do that? If it's such a good idea, how come someone else hasn't done it yet? That will never work. You don't know what you're talking about. These words of doubt often get so loud that we fail to act. A horrible feeling builds in our stomach. Sometimes we can't sleep. We fail to move forward. So we stay with what is safe and opportunities pass us by. We watch life passing by as we sit immobilized with a cold knot in our body. We have all felt this at one time in our lives, some more than others. Peter Lynch of Fidelity Magella, Magellan Mutual Fund fame refers to warnings about the sky falling as noise, and we all hear it. Noise is either created inside our heads or comes from outside, often from friends, family, co-workers, and the media. Lynch recalls a time during the 1950s when the threat of nuclear war was so prevalent in the news that people began building fallout shelters and storing food and water. If they had invested that money wisely in the market instead of building a fallout shelter, they'd probably be financially independent today. When violence breaks out in a city, gun sales go up all over the country. A person dies from rare hamburger meat in the state of Washington, and the Arizona Health Department orders restaurants to have all beef cooked well done. A drug company runs a TV commercial in February showing people catching the flu. Colds go up as well as sales of cold medicine. Most people are poor because when it comes to investing, the world is filled with chicken littles running around yelling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And chicken littles are effective because every one of us is a little chicken. It often takes great courage to not let rumors and talk of doom and gloom affect your doubts and fears. But a savvy investor knows that the seemingly worst of times is actually the best time to make money. When everyone else is too afraid to act, they pull the trigger and are rewarded. Some time ago, a friend named Richard came from Boston to visit Kim and me in Phoenix. He was impressed with what we had done through stocks and real estate. The Phoenix real estate prices were depressed. We spent two days showing him what we thought were excellent opportunities for cash flow and capital appreciation. Kim and I are not real estate agents. We are strictly investors. After identifying a unit in a resort community, we called an agent who sold it sold it to him that afternoon. 
The price was a mere $42,000 for a two-bedroom townhome. Similar units were going for $65,000. He had found a bargain. Excited, he went. He bought it and returned to Boston. Two weeks later, the agent called to say that our friend had backed out. I immediately, I called immediately to find out why. All he said was that he talked to his neighbor and the neighbor told him it was a bad deal. He was paying too much. I asked Richard if his neighbor was an investor. Richard said he was not. When I asked why he listened to him, Richard got defensive and simply said he wanted to keep looking. The real estate market in Phoenix turned and a few years later, the little unit renting for $1,000 a month to $2,500 in the peak winter months, the unit was worth $95,000. All Richard had to put down was $5,000, and he would have start had a start to get out of the rat race. Today, he still has done nothing. Richard's backing out did not surprise me. It's called buyer's remorse, and it affects all of us. The little chicken won, and a chance of freedom was lost. In another example, I hold a small portion of my assets in tax lien certificates instead of CDs. I earn 16% per year on my money, which certainly beats the interest rate banks offer on CDs. The certificates are secure, secured by real estate and enforced by state law, which is also better than most banks. The formula they are bought on makes them safe. They just lack liquidity. So I learn, I look at them as two to seven year CDs. Almost every time I tell someone that I hold my money this way, especially if they have money in CDs, they will tell me it's risky. They tell me why I should not do it. When I ask them where where they get their information, they say, from a friend or an investment magazine. They've never done it, and they're telling someone who's doing it why they shouldn't. The lowest yield I look for is 16%, but people who are filled with doubt are willing to accept far fewer return. Doubt is expensive. My point is that it's those doubts and cynicism that keep most people poor and playing it safe. The real world is simply waiting for you to get rich. Only a person's doubts keep them poor. As I said, getting out of the rat race is technically easy. It doesn't take much education, but those doubts are cripplers for most people. Cynics never win, said Rich Dad. Unchecked doubt and fear creates a cynic. Cynics crit criticize and winners analyze, was another one of his favorite sayings. Rich Dad explained that criticism blinded while analysis opened eyes. Analysis allowed winners to see that that critics were blind and to see opportunities that everyone else missed. And finding what people miss is key to any success. Real estate is a powerful investment tool for anyone seeking financial independence or freedom. It is a unique investment tool, yet every time I mention real estate as a vehicle, I often hear, I don't want to fix toilets. That's what Peter Lynch calls noise. That's what my rich dad would say is the cynic talking. Someone who criticizes and does not analyze. Someone who lets their doubts and fear, fears close, close their mind instead of opening their eyes. So when someone says, I don't want to fix toilets, I want to fire back, what makes you think I want to? They're saying a toilet is more important than what they want. I talk about freedom from the rat race and they focus on toilets. That is the thought pattern that keeps most people poor. They criticize instead of analyze. I don't want to hold the key to their success, to your success, Rich Dad would say, because I, too, do not want to fix toilets. I shop hard for a property manager who does fix toilets, and by finding a great property manager who runs houses or apartments well, my cash flow goes up. But more importantly, a great property manager allows me to buy a lot more real estate since I don't have to fix toilets. A great property manager is key to success in real estate. Finding a good manager is more important to me than the real estate. A great property manager often hears a great deal of great deals before real estate agents do, which makes them even more valuable. Excuse me. Um, that is what Rich Dad meant by I don't want to hold the key to your success because I don't want to fix toilets either. I figured out how to buy more real estate and expedite my getting out of the rat race. The people who continue to say, I don't want to fix toilets, often deny themselves the use of this powerful investment vehicle. Toilets are more important than their freedom. In the stock market, I often hear people say, I don't want to lose money. Well, that what makes them think I or anyone else like losing money? They're 
They don't make money because they choose to not lose money. Instead of analyzing, they close their minds to another powerful investment vehicle, the stock market. I was riding with a friend past our neighborhood gas station. He looked up and saw that the price of gas was going up and thus the price of oil. My friend is a worry wart or a chicken little. To him, the sky is always going to fall and it usually does on him. When we got home, he showed us, he showed me all the stats as to why the price of oil was going to go up over the next few years. Statistics I had never seen before, even though I already owned substantial shares of an existing oil company. With that information, I immediately began looking for and found a new undervalued oil company that was about, about to find some oil deposits. My broker was excited about this new company and I bought 15,000 shares for 65 cents per share. Three months later, the same friend and I drove by the gas station, and sure, sure enough, the price of a gallon had gone up nearly 15%. Again, the chicken little worried and complained. I smiled because a month earlier, that little oil company hit oil, and those 15,000 shares went up to more than $3 per share since he had first given me the tip. And the price of gas will continue to go up if my, what my friend says is true. If most people understand how a stop worked in the stock market investing, there would be more people investing to win instead of investing not to lose. A stop is simply a computer command that sells your stock automatically if the price begins to drop, helping to minimize your losses and maximize some gains. It's a great tool for those who are terrified of losing. So whenever I hear people focusing on their I don't wants rather than what they do want, I know the noise in their head must be loud. Chicken Little has, has never has taken over the, their brain and is yelling, the sky is falling, the toilets are breaking. So they avoid their don't wants, but pay a huge price. They may never get what they want in life. Instead of analyzing, their inner Chicken Little closes their mind. Rich Dad gave me a way of looking at Chicken Little. Just do what Colonel Sanders did. At the age of 66, he lost his business and began to live on Social Security check. It wasn't enough. He went around the country selling his recipes for fried chicken. He was turned down 1,009 times before someone said yes. And he went on to become a multimillionaire at an age when most people are quitting. He was a brave and tenacious man, Rich Dad said of Harlan Sanders. So when you're in doubt and feeling a little afraid, just do what Colonel Sanders did to his chicken little. He fried it.